You guys ready? You guys ready for this? Oh shit. Oh snap. Oh shit. Here it comes. Oh yeah. What? It's actually gonna be a couple more minutes. Yo, he's already 15 minutes late. What an inconsiderate bastard. <laughs> We're gonna be starting in a few minutes, everybody. Where are you guys from? <laughs> Cameron, all over the world. 
Where are you from? I love you. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fine. Okay, listen. I, all right. So this story right now, uh, it's it's a story that uh, is is about uh, greed and uh, lust and uh, uh, achievement and uh, dicks. Uh, well, I mean, uh, one. One dick, technically, uh, and, and a couple of balls. Uh, but they're great balls, you're gonna see them. Uh, all right, sex place, uh, the, the uh, summer after my freshman year of college, uh, in what would be just a, a series of terrible decisions, I, uh, I decided instead of going to get an internship, uh, I was just gonna go back to uh, Florida, where I was raised, uh, to hang out with my friends from Florida, uh, to just get drunk, because Florida. <laughs> uh, and so I, I go, and it's a, a house of four dudes, uh, with four rooms, and then I move in. Which, you don't have to be a math major to realize that I did not have a room. Uh, I was sleeping on the couch, okay? Uh, another thing that is key to this story is, is I had a job at Bennigan's. <laughs> Don't know what Bennigan's fans in the house tonight. <laughs> well, slot you to you, motherfuckers. <laughs> so I'm working at Bennigan's. I have no idea why I'm working there. I have no idea why I decide I need to get a job at Bennigan's, but I do. This is a party house, as it was uh, built. And uh, we decided, as many college students do, to play a lot of beer pong. Are you familiar with the rules of beer pong? No. No. Wow. Okay. Good. Apparently, it's all Ivy Leaguers here tonight. <laughs> Jesus fuck. We're from Utah. Uh, uh, okay. I'm sorry. Utah. <laughs> because Utah. All right. So, so here's the deal. Uh, beer pong is, is what happens. You set up a bunch of cups on a table, not unlike this. Uh, you have uh, cups on one side, cups on the other side. You put them in some kind of formation. Take ping pong ball. Lands in the cup. Cups got beer in it, people on the other side drink the beer. Person with the, who eliminates the other side's cups the fastest, wins. It's gross, it's, it's really gross and, and disgusting for a lot of reasons that we're gonna get into. Uh, but it's also incredibly fun. It was so fun. We had a great time for like two weeks. And then it just wasn't enough. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. We could just have a beer pong friendly round robin. No! We needed to have a beer pong league! <laughs> and if we had a beer pong league, that means we had to get beer pong stats! And if we keep beer pong stats, that means we need a whiteboard. So we kept a whiteboard with stats. Who won? Who lost? Who was in pole position? Who was in line for a shot at the title? Because, oh yes, we had titles. <laughs> Now initially, this started out really, really good, okay? This was really fun. Uh, we, we had Excel spreadsheets, we were tracking uh, a shooting percentage. Uh, you know, it was, it was uh, yeah, we, had, we had a whiteboard, we're, we're, we're tallying everything. In, in the big Venn diagram of alcoholic and geek, we were nestled in the sweet cleavage. But this is not a story about a bunch of fun people having a fun time, no. This is a story about the night it all came crashing down. So I'm working at Bennigan's, I work at Double. If you've never worked in the service industry, that means I work two shifts in a row. These two shifts were the middle shift of the day, the lunch shift, and the closing shift. So I get out at about 10.30. It's a late night. I'm in the mood for a few, a few beverages, but I would like to close it down a little early because I have to open the restaurant in the morning. Uh, I don't know why Bennigan's would think people would want to have breakfast there. <laughs> but it's probably why they're bankrupt. <laughs> so I get there, unbeknownst to me. My buddy uh, Rio has won the championship off my friend Anthony. But Anthony is playing in his comeback game and it is down to one cup on either side. As I step into the threshold of the apartment, Anthony hits the 
final cup, winning his title back, and he goes absolutely batshit insane. <laughs> now, if a title changes hands twice in one night, that's usually the end of the evening. You know, you don't want to devalue it, have it go all evening. So you just sort of retire it and say, hey, champ, come on back tomorrow. Maybe we can have another game. But Rio had rebuttals. That means he gets a shoot on Anthony's cup. He hits that one. Now we go into overtime. Three cups on either side. First shot that Rio takes. Sails over all three cups. Bounces one, two, three, four, five, six times off a wall like, like a Magic Johnson Larry Bird shot. Just all over the place like a Rube Goldberg. And lands smack dab in a bucket of disgusting brackish water. <laughs> You might ask yourself, why, Justin, did you have a bucket of disgusting <laughs> brackish water laying open while you were playing beer pong? And initially, it was for a good cause. It was a mop bucket. <laughs> Somebody brought a mop bucket out. They said, these floors are disgusting. And boy, where are they? Mops it up, puts it back down, and then maybe even mops it again. Might have even been a third time. <laughs> Problem here is that nobody emptied it. <laughs> and it became a contentious issue in the house on whose job it was to empty it. And now a political statement on leaving it there. <laughs> when I tell you that these fucking beer pong balls would find its way into that bucket by any means necessary, I am not kidding. It did not matter where we put the bucket. <laughs> One side of the, uh, of the apartment, plop. The other side of the apartment, plop. Upstairs, plop. I don't even know how it got there. <laughs> David Blaine could lock it in a safe in Harlem, throw the ball the other way, and open the safe. There's the goddamn ball in the bucket. <laughs> now normally, because we're animals, we just wash off the ball, keep playing. But... It's kind of late in the night, everybody had been going for a little bit, so folks were hungry. So the decision is made, let's go ahead and get more balls, also go get some food on the way out. Great, delicious. Look over to my buddy Ryan, hey, what do you want? I don't know, pizza. Mm, pizza. Look over to my buddy uh, Rico, I say, hey man, what do you want? Oh, I don't know, I was thinking of Taco Bell. Oh, Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, uh, yes, no, Joe Anich, uh is apparently the heir to the Bell fortune. <laughs> of the Connecticut Bells? Uh, and then I look to Anthony, and I say, hey man, what do you want to eat? He goes, I don't know. I was thinking, Benny. <laughs> I just left there less than 20 minutes ago after working a double I had to be back there early in the morning I looked him dead in the eye and I said you motherfucker it'll be a cold day in hell 10 minutes later we're at Benedict's <laughs> table full of Monte Cristos powdered sugar atop Waitress comes over to me, she's like, did you just have your friends like meet you in the parking lot? <laughs> Don't want to talk about it. <laughs> go ahead and eat our food. We go ahead and we get the balls. We go back to the apartment and this game, this championship rematch will not fucking end. It stretches until 12.45 in the morning. Overtime after overtime, cup after cup. And then finally, Rio sinks the final cup to retain the championship. That's the end of the night. Won his championship, retained the championship, don't want it to get cheap, cheap it. It's time to settle on out to the dusty trail. Uh, Anthony was not in agreement on that theory. Uh, he became irate, very angry, confrontational. So you're trying to duck me, you piece of shit, you're ducking me. 
We're like, all right, man, settle down. You're really drunk. It's all right. It's fine. Let's just go ahead and, and you can go to your room. So we walk him up to his room, and he's fucking fighting him the whole time. He's like, but you're fucking ducking me is what you're doing. Put him in his room. He locks the door. We go downstairs. End of the night. Finally. I got to get up and open the Bennigans in six hours. Until we heard such a clatter that we ran upstairs to see what was the matter. <laughs> and now everything's going through our head. We're like, oh, fuck, man, he was really drunk. I really hope he didn't fall down and, like, bust his head. Uh, and, you know, his girlfriend was in the bed. So we're like, oh, Jesus. Like, I mean, like, I, I hope there's, I mean, like, God forbid some sort of, like, domestic thing. So we bang on the door, bang on the door. Nothing, nothing. Bang on the door, bang on the door, nothing. Finally, door opens. It's his girlfriend. Rachel. And instead of a look of terror, there is a look of resigned sadness. <laughs> Disappointment. It was as if, I know, it was as if she had just seen her favorite childhood cartoon character dead of autoerotic asphyxiation. <laughs> it's the only way I can describe it. She just points us into the bathroom. Walk into the bathroom, there's Anthony, his shirt is off, and he is covered in white powder. The white powder is the uh, way that all of the fixtures in his bathroom once hung on the wall. <laughs> that was no longer the case. Table rack, pa! Soap dish, pa! And there he is, in just this rage refractory period. Like, like, uh, and we're like, Anthony, what the fuck happened? Uh, and he's just like, I need a cigarette. All right, man, come on. Get him up on our shoulders. We're walking him down the stairs. And he says something to me that is truly amazing. He says, man, I just get so mad sometimes. <laughs> I feel like the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Just like that. It goes up at the end. Like a sharp up. I feel like the Incredible Hulk. It's all the emotion of the original Bill Bixby series. In one sentence. Just listen to that one sentence and you get all of it. So we take him down. And he's about to smoke his cigarette. And he takes a look back over his shoulder. And he sees the beer bomb tape. <laughs> and just in that moment, the dormant ashes of his rage, Phoenix-like, sprung to life! <laughs> and he gets in my face! Oh, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> you want the championship! <laughs> you just want to put me to bed so you can get a shot at the title, don't you? Don't you? Now, at this point, I'm having very little uh, patience for Anthony, uh, as you might imagine, and I, begun, I begin to become a little uh, combative. Tell him, Anthony, it's true. I made a deal with Rio. <gasps> I knew it, huh? But I'm willing to forgo that title shot. And I'm willing, furthermore, to give it to you. Okay. If only that cigarette you have in your hands, you put it out on your dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the length it took Anthony to accept my bargain <laughs> and immediately, by the way, he became very calm after that, as if he'd settled something. Like, first, like, you mind fucking you, mind? like, okay, sure, yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Takes his shit out. Of course, we're outside on the stoop. So, you know, out in public, takes his shit out. 
and he begins a gigantic guitar windmill motion of his lit cigarette. <laughs> that was at this point that I only imagine Rachel's dick sense is tingling. <laughs> Because she comes bumping down the stairs. No, 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 Anthony, no, Anthony, no, Anthony, no, don't, stop, no, don't. And he just looks back at her like, hey man, I'm sorry, the missiles were loaded, sweetheart. Like, there's nothing I can do. I wish I could. I wish I could. When Rachel says something that is so impactful, it's like the voice of God immediately changes the tenor of the entire situation. She says, Anthony, champions wear pants. <laughs> coming down, coming down, coming down. Champions wear pants. And it stops. <laughs> like, could not have gotten any closer. <laughs> Pubes are singing. <laughs> and again, he looks back at her and says, I put pants on. All right, fine. Why'd you have to yell at me? <laughs> Puts a cigarette out, diffuses the situation. Rachel's the hero of the night. Starts to walk Anthony back to their room, except for the fact that to turn around is to again <laughs> gaze upon the beer pong table. <laughs> and yet again, Anthony in flames. Oh, oh, now I get it. Rachel wants the title shot. <laughs> I've had enough of it at this point. It's 1.30 in the morning, I gotta be up to open the Bennigans in five hours. I say, you wanna know what, Anthony, I'm sick of your shit. You can have a title shot, but you gotta catch me first, and I run. <laughs> it's a bold gambit, I understand, but it worked. Anthony, stark naked, chases after me. <laughs> We're running around the block. Now, it is at this point that I must uh, inform you that my dear, dear, dear friend, Anthony uh, has uh, tremendous uh, balls. He's just got, I think we've all got, is there, round of applause if you've got that friend who takes his balls out all the time? <laughs> don't, don't, come on. You're amongst friends. You're amongst friends. <laughs> don't let them control you. <laughs> Bring it out. Friend Anthony pulls his balls out all the time. We can all sketch them from memory if we were forced to. <laughs> when I say tremendous balls, I mean that they are long. <laughs> he has what I like to call the race to the ankles. <laughs> and in case you're handicapping, the left is winning. <laughs> so when I tell you that he runs after me stark naked, what you need to appreciate is the fact that his hilariously long balls are just, like, ping-ponging. <laughs> the faster, because he's like, full extension fingers, like Usain Bolt sprint. His balls are just hitting his hips, like, as he runs. I'm making turns around uh, the, the, the different uh, apartment complexes, and his balls are doing, like, cartoon, like, like pendulum centrifugal force, like... <laughs> We get back to the apartment, and we're both fucking ridiculously out of shape, so we're like, <laughs> are we done? I say to him, he's like, yeah, we're done. Okay, all right, that was too much. We shake hands, he's still naked. <laughs> and he goes back upstairs, only but glancing. One more time. This time it's Ryan and Rio standing there. He again lights into a, a gigantic screaming fit. It was Ryan all along! I was hoodwinked! Ryan was the true culprit! He starts fucking stomping, stomping!
one thing as he walks forward, walks forward toward Ryan and Rio, walks forward, and just as he again breaks out into his big sprint, he steps, plop, in the bucket of black mud. <laughs> What happens next, I can only truly remember in slow motion. As he goes, whoop, the bucket goes up, and a gigantic shamu crest of black water arches above him. He goes absolutely horizontal and lands flat-backed on his tile, only to be drenched in a tsunami of the most disgusting, vile black water you've ever seen in your entire life. Sploosh! Which finally put out his inner rage. <laughs> He went back up to bed, hopefully taking a shower. <laughs> and the rest of us decided that we couldn't handle the beer pong league. We deleted the spreadsheets, wiped out the whiteboard, because we now knew that indeed champions wear pants. <laughs> but none of us were big enough to wear. <laughs> All right, uh, I want to do a thing right now. How many of you guys listen to the Jerry Show? Slightly more than people who see their friends' balls. Good, okay. I'm in the Target demo. Uh, one of the things that is really, really special to me on the jury show is the fact that there is an amazing back and forth between a lot of the listeners, uh, and uh, there is just a lot of uh, really personal stories and funny stories uh, that, that, that happen, and I enjoy reading them. Also, oddly enough, uh, I've apparently become uh, the internet's crossroads for discussion of transgender issues. Uh, <laughs> so it is perfect. A lot of these themes Tied together, I got an email from somebody uh, that I think uh, you guys are all uh, going to very much uh, enjoy. Let's go ahead and get a big round of applause for Abby. There we go. Uh, Abby. You emailed me and you said you had a story. I was looking for stories to, to have as part of this one-man show. I have not heard all the details of the story, right? Not all of them. Not all of them. You, you, gave, me, you gave me a pretty good idea of it, but, uh, but I haven't heard all of it. So let's, uh, let's go ahead okay. and, and get, uh, well, what is, what is the story that you'd like to tell here today? This is a story of uh, me when I was in seventh grade spanning until like a few years ago, I think. Oh, Jesus, this is epic. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, no, I didn't. No, I didn't know we were in for Narnia here. This is, this is great. A coming of age story. This, this is a story featuring um, Emma Stone, the Avengers, a bat mitzvah, and butt sex. <laughs> Sounds like a party. Uh, all right, go ahead, lay it on me. So, um, it was in seventh grade, and I was at my uh, good friend's bat mitzvah, and being the hormonal weirdo lad that I was, yeah. I found myself attracted to the really weird woman in the corner dancing alone to 90s pop music. That's great. See, those, those people, and, and they can be male or female, I like to call uh, knife collections. <laughs> it's not smart, <laughs> but it's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I don't want to give too many like points about her appearance or what she looked like or anything, but I'd say like the prettiest thing about her was her name was Emma Stone. So, okay, so her I, name I, was Emma Stone. That's about not it. the famous Emma Stone. Uh, no. Okay, <laughs> just just check. <laughs> I got just check. That's fine. That's fine. No, no, no. To the argument itself, be true. So, so we in our our uh, defined seventh grade way began to flirt with each other, and um, actually that night outside the boat house at the bat mitzvah, I had my very first kiss. Oh, look at that! Yeah. True love at the bar mitzvah, ladies and gentlemen. There's a bat mitzvah. It was like taking two soaking wet sponges and just throwing them at each other. <laughs> oh, good God! <laughs> I mean, a grosser description than Anthony's balls. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 
Yeah, so, so you can get black so, water. So, so you kiss Emma, and Emma yeah. kisses you. So we had the typical like seventh grade mom drive us to the movie theater kind sure. of Sure. So that lasted for a few months. We just kind of fell out of touch. And about ten years later, I was talking to um, a friend of mine, and they're like, "Oh, I I, I know this person here. It's the contact information. You can get a hold of them." Yeah. And so I, I dropped her a line, and I was like, "Emma, it's Abe. It's great to hear from you." Um, so you know immediately that it's it's. Emma Stone yeah, yeah. from Emma Stone. Yeah, and we're chatting and everything, and we're we're talking. I was like, Emma, it's great to see you again. And she's like, actually, it's Caleb now. Ah, so okay. Yeah. Uh, now and, and just to make it clear to everybody, I think when when you had your first kiss uh, at, at that fateful time, it was Emma. You, and, yeah, yeah, you were not Abby. No, no, no. Yeah, no. And I, I at this point I had just started getting into like. Is this a thing? Is it not a thing? Sure. I don't know, but I'm exploring it. I was very... So no, you guys have done the full X. Exactly. <laughs> no, like you said, it was great. My, my first kiss was a straight kiss. Which is kind of cool. Nice! All right. <laughs> so we're chatting back and forth, and we're being friendly, and this is all on Tumblr. I don't even know. Oh, all right. Facebook chat. Just, just skip it. Whatever. Just so we said together. Just topic. tell me it's AIM, so I don't feel... Uh, <laughs> I feel like this person. Go ahead. Um, so we're chatting, we set up a coffee date, and we're about to turn in, and he asked me, hey, would you mind uh, proofreading the story a little? Oh, and I, was, I love it. Yeah, a literary uh, scholar. Yeah. Like, okay, sure, I'd, I'd really be interested in that. So he sends me a story, and I, I open it up, and it's an Avengers fan fiction. Okay. It's an erotic Avengers fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and are I'm, there any other kind? <laughs> I'm, I'm really tired of me being the only one that can't stand to see Avengers anymore, so I'm going to share the whole thing with you guys so you guys get ruined, too. <laughs> That's a great way to do it. Exactly, yeah. by the way. Share my misery. Sure. Yes. Um, Steve Rogers is not doing so hot in the Trice Kelly with the Avengers training missions, and Nick Fury sends the Black Widow and Hawkeye to go investigate to find out what is going on. <laughs> so, hold on. <laughs> Nick Fury is like, like, Hawkeye, Black Widow, I think Cat's kind of bummed. <laughs> I really use a helping hand. And so, yeah, so they go investigating and they, they're crawling through the events of this huge, use um, no, it was the helicarrier. Okay, sure. But, uh, yeah, not important. Um, so they're tra crawling through the vents, and they're, they're hearing these noises, and they're not really sure what's going on. They, they crawl up to one of the vents, and they're, they're looking through the air vent right above Captain America's bedroom. And they look down, and they see Captain America. On. Playing Parteezy! Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, now, Captain America. On all fours. Uh-huh. Getting butt-fucked by the Hulk. Oh, my God! <laughs> While blowing Iron Man. Oh! In the iron suit? Half of it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it just like an iron altar top? Like <laughs> the iron cod piece is just laying in the corner. Oh yeah, sure. So, uh, just winking. And like, Black Widow looks over to Hawkeye and says, I don't see how that's a party. <laughs> <laughs> Avengers uh, fan fiction, and I don't know what to do, and no. I am just kind of at a loss for words, and I, I go back to Caleb, and I say, for someone who found a dick, you really know a lot about dicks, because <laughs> this was long pages, yeah. <laughs> and that really set her off, and that's when I realized that people are sensitive to a lot of different things, and reminding somebody about that is not a good thing. And that was the first introduction into kind of the transgender sensitivity training. Sure. I, yeah. So, well, for real, that shit's got some second act problems. Yeah. Like, I think we can all agree on that. And I, I confident it was canceled, never heard from her again. I really don't care if you're in sequel, so. Well, I'll tell you what, we're here for you. Everybody give Abby a round of applause. <laughs> For you, uh, it's a, it's about wrestling. Yeah. That image 
married to God. Uh, Taco Bell and wrestling. Okay. <laughs> that's right. All right. I love wrestling. I, I, I love it. I love it so much. I love it because uh, it is a very unique art form in that it is built from the audience in as opposed to the performer out. I'm up here on stage trying to tell you guys a story, and I hope that you get something out of it. But if one or two of you get something out of it, then I'm happy because I've made some kind of connection. That is not possible in professional wrestling. Professional wrestling is built on an audience's reaction. If an audience does not do what the performer wants them to do, then they have absolutely failed. And the way that they achieve this on a regular basis is by giving the audience what they want, whether or not they know that they want it. Now, the way that you tell a never-ending story with this idea in mind is through dramatic cues, costumes, language, theme songs. A lot of things have theme songs. Baseballs have theme songs. Baseball players pick their own theme songs, they come out to the, to, to the plate, and they do whatever they're gonna do. But they're fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> because baseball players pick songs that they like. They pick songs that they would enjoy on their off time. Club bangers, country songs, boring shit. <laughs> Wrestlers, on the other hand, have to have a different burden for their songs. Their songs are not what they like. Their songs are them. It is as if a Calvinistic god issued them the song as they walked out to the ring. They don't get a choice. And so, I would like to introduce you to a song that I consider to be maybe the most important of the 90s. I'm a last man. <laughs> Meaning that it spread farther and wider. 
That means that there were a lot of people that went to wrestling or aware of wrestling or watched wrestling that had no interest in it. They were really just there because everybody else was there. And in most trends, that just kind of comes and goes. But in wrestling, it's significant. Because again, wrestling is built from the audience in. Meaning, if the audience is larger and the audience is more diverse, and I would argue if the audience is a greater representation of the American populace than it would be otherwise, then what you get in the center of that ring is what America really wants. more like now than the last 10 years were. A lot of the conversations that we're having right now about gender, sexuality, race, were big gigantic topics in the 90s. What happened in between was a huge decade long sojourn into a conversation about safety. Effectively, we had the folk song, I Kissed the Girl, 9-11, Afghanistan, Iraq, MySpace, Katy Perry's I Kissed the Girl. If you Mad Magazine fold that in, <laughs> you effectively have one unbroken cultural line. Which brings me to the best part of this song. Buns of glory, buns of steel. Your lies won't give away the truth of how I feel. What? <laughs> if this was a Melissa Etheridge line, nobody would blink an eye. And yet that pales in comparison to this. Walk behind me, I feel the heat. That's why the girls don't walk behind me down the street. <laughs> Folks, I've listened to this song thousands of times. True story, I have a media request in with the person who wrote it who still works for the WWE because I have a lot of unanswered questions. <laughs> This is not one of them. I know for a fact that he is talking to his own ass. <laughs> you walk behind me, I feel the heat. And then I guess that's why the girls don't walk behind me down the street as a fart joke. But, uh... <laughs> this is a man whose power resides in his own ass. Now, it's very simplistic to say that Mr. Ass is gay. Of course he's gay. <laughs> but he's also straight, pretty clearly. And if you only focus on the sexual elements of this song, what you ignore are the themes of violence and retribution that permeate it. Is it Mr. Ass telling us that if we reject his urges, we better watch out? Or is it our own inner voices saying, to thine own self be true or else? All those fans in the 90s that came and looked at an empty ring until Billy Gunn, Mr. Ass, appeared within it, liked him, but they didn't love him. He didn't become champion. He was popular, but he hit the glass ceiling. What I submit to you tonight is that Mr. Ass belongs in 2015. <laughs> what we have with Mr. Ass is a cultural Captain America. <laughs> Frozen in a time that was not meant to understand him, only to be thawed out right now and right here. Now, Mr. Ass is a pansexual opus <laughs> designed to celebrate the base human urges to fuck and fight. We might not all want to lick stick and
and kick the asses of our neighbor, friend, and family member, but we probably all want to do at least one of those things to one of those people. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.